servants, yes, they rob I. Sold I to the merchant ships. Minutes after they took I from the bottomless pit. My hands were made strong by the hand of the Almighty. We fought in this generation triumphantly. Won't you help to say he sought the freedom with all I ever had? Redemption song, redemption song. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. No but ourselves can free our minds. in this video. Have no fear for atomic energy. Cause none of them can stop the time. How long shall they kill our prophets? When we stand aside and look. Some say it's just a part of it. We've got to fulfill the book. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? Cause all I ever had redemption song, redemption song. To slave, no but ourselves can free our minds. Have no fear for atomic energy, cause none of them can stop the tide. How long shall they kill our prophets? When we stand aside and look strong, say it's just a part of it. We've got to fulfill the book. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom with all I ever had? Redemption song, redemption song, these songs of freedom with all I ever had. Redemption song, redemption song, redemption song. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the No Exemption from Genome Redemption, the Manifestation of Reality Through Science and Faith. This virtual webinar is a defining event celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day as an integral component of the Black Women for Positive Change ninth Annual Week of Health Empowerment, Nonviolence, and Opportunities. It goes from the 10th through the 18th. The focus of today's program is to engage the community in dialogues that combine science-based knowledge and faith-based wisdom on human identity, population diversity, and the global community. It will also provide new insights on the 2020 pandemics, racism, violence, and COVID-19. Today, our esteemed Black women panelists tell the story from their diverse professional viewpoints of human creation and evolution gleaned from good science and spirituality based on clinical translation 
and human transformation data grounded in the truth of the genomic text on human identity, population diversity, and global community in health and disease. Our panelists, they include Dr. Stephanie Myers, co-founder and national co-chair of Black Women for Positive Change Incorporated. Our next speaker, Dr. Georgia Dunstan, president, CEO, founder, Whole Genome Science Foundation Incorporated, Howard University Professor Emerita, founding and former director, National Genome Center, and that's the National Human Genome Center for Howard University's College of Medicine. Dr. Barbara Reynolds, ordained minister, chaplain for Black Women for Positive Change Incorporated, civil rights activist, journalist, and author. Dr. Pranessa Seal, founder and CEO, Balm and Gilead Incorporated, and home of the Healthy Churches 2020 National Conference. Dr. Orisade Awadola, root psychologist, author, lecturer, researcher, and founder for the Institute of African Centered Thought. And finally, Dr. Fatima Jackson, professor of biology and director of the W. Montague Cobb Research Laboratory for Howard University. Just so you know, we will allow time at the end of the program for our panelists to answer your questions. So we ask that you type your questions or comments in the chat room during the webinar. Also, please include your name so we can identify you. Additionally, throughout the program, we will have a survey running for the 2020 Week of Health Empowerment, Nonviolence and Opportunities. We ask you to use the link when you'll see at the bottom of your screen, and there you can participate. We also have the link posted in the chat room. Today's webinar and the entertainment, it includes semi-finalists from a spoken word poetry slam contest known as the Harmony Jam. In this national contest, high school students have competed for cash prizes up to $500. And today, you'll see the top 10 semifinalist videos and we'll be announcing the top 10 winners. I'll tell you more about that later in the program. The Black Women for Positive Change Incorporated in partnership with the Whole Genome Science Foundation would like to thank their community partners, DC TV and Feelings on Fire Production. So without further ado, let's get started. Please welcome the co-founder and national co-chair of Black Women for Positive Change Incorporated, Dr. Stephanie Myers, whose conversation is regarding the culture of violence in our community and our society. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Ma. Thank you, Dr. Ward, and thank you for all that you do. And on behalf of Black Women for Positive Change and a wonderful intergenerational network we have of Black men and people who are not even Black and younger generations, we are very, very pleased that you are joining us for the ninth annual week of Health Empowerment Nonviolence and opportunities. That is our theme this year because we know health empowerment is critical during this time of COVID and during this time of violence that's happening all over our country. And we want to thank Dr. Georgia Dunstan with the whole genome science foundation. I don't know how many of you on this call realize that we are truly blessed to have one of the foremost human genome scientists in the country as a part of our network. And we thank her, we are proud of her, and appreciate her so much. We have to look at this whole issue of the culture of violence. Violence, racism, all these issues are connected. And as a part of our discussion today, I really want to talk about focusing on how do we look at this issue of violence. 
America is a very unusual country because we have more people incarcerated than anywhere else in the world. Now, why is that? What is it about America that causes this problem? And so today I'm going to be calling on sociologists, psychiatrists, psychologists, anthropologists, young people who are trying to decide what careers they want to go into, theologians. We must begin to study what is the origin of violence. Where did it start? Now we know that survival and when you're in the jungle and the animals are coming after you, you have to have human survival. We know this, but we're not in the jungles now. So we have to know why is, what is the heritage of individuals, families, and cultures that causes such violence? When we look at America, we realize that the beginnings of our beloved nation started in violence. People came over from Europe, Christopher Columbus, the Spanish explorers, the British, and they literally attacked and just decimated the Native American people. Today we're celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day. Well, these people were really wiped out by violence. They weren't the ones perpetrating it. It was the ones coming in. And then we know with the African slave trade, people, my ancestors, many of your ancestors, literally taken off out of their communities, put into violent circumstances, shipped over here, and held into violence for 12 generations of violence in this country. Sure, we got free after the Civil War, but we've also seen violence perpetrated in our communities, even today. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, every day you wake up. Then we know that the white indentured servants, this is something we must investigate more because England opened up their prisons in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, and sent more than 50,000 indentured white servants over here. Many of them were ex-convicts and they were made wardens and law enforcement officers and overseers on the plantation. Those people have descendants and their descendants don't even know that they came out of a culture of violence. So we really have to stop just looking at us because we as a community, we tend to look at our community and say, we're the problem, it's poverty, it's racism, it's more than that. We have to look at where is the beginnings of it. I think our universities, our faith institutions, our government agencies, we have to research Europe. We have to help people understand that there were cultures. There's one culture from Germany called the Obertrites. They were a violent, warlike culture. Well, 50% of the white Americans in America are Germans. So maybe there's a connection between 50% of the German inherited people here, the Obertrite culture that was powerful back in the 10 hundreds and 9 hundreds and 11 hundreds. We must connect the dots. So I'm really pleased that we're here today. I look forward to hearing from the panelists. I'm excited to hear about the Harmony Jam and the Poetry Slam. But really, as we go forward, everyone, please examine the violence that you are seeing and ask the question, how did it start? And just like John Legend said in that powerful opening, what about the interventions in the beginning? What can we do? And I loved hearing from James at San Quentin I mean, obviously a brilliant young man who should not be in prison. So thank you very much, Dr. Ward and to, and to Dr. Dunstan. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Let's get to what the root of violence is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Myers. And now let's meet two of our first finalists in the Harmony Jam Poetry Slam contest. First, We'll hear from Ijoma Okiri, followed by Maxwell Men. The early stories include a bond, a connection. We had the privilege of being bystanders of pure happiness. Not even an adamant wedge between them could tear them apart. Every second they spent together gave us hope for a still world, an idealistic relationship like no other. We all remember her luminous glow, that grin that circled from ear to ear. Oh, they were the perfect duo. How could she just disappear like that? Imagine how much devastation that left him. She was truly the yin to his yang. 
And so it seemed that way from the outside looking in. But she kind of just vanished. Mysteriousness clouded all our thoughts. None of us are to ever know the true anger and aggression that engraved itself into their foundation, somehow disguising itself when exposed to the outdoors. It even hid behind a barrier where nobody shall see in, nor was her scream ever let out. He was the last one to feel her warm body. To this day, he roams around the streets with his head held high. Oh, what a tough man he must be. The Divine Violin by Maxwell May. Drop the guns that break our souls. Play a tune that heals our holes. Forget the knives that pierce our skin. We must use the kind heart that we have within. Don't keep knees on our necks. Don't pull the trigger when we turn our backs. Play a note that rings in the air. Use for others, you'll get your share. Drop the guns that break our souls. Play a tune that heals our holes. We make kindness our first answer. The divine violin will be there when we need it most. Not done yet. There's always more. Kindness is the key to unlocking the door. Kindness like the butterfly that lands on our s'mores. Kindness the summer clouds that have cleaned up for the big blue skies. Kindness is the Christmas present that's caught you by surprise. Violence. Violence is the anger shovel that digs up your grave. Violence should never be the way us humans behave. Violence is big as imprisonment but smaller than a compliment. If violence is really the answer, there will be no accomplishments. Thank you for listening to my poem. I am Dawn O'Donnell, and I am the communications coordinator at DCTV. The tension in our community since the murder of George Floyd has been extremely unnerving and stressful for the entire community. I have a unique perspective regarding the tension that exists between the black community and the policing community, because prior to coming to DC TV, I worked as an auxiliary police officer in the 47th precinct in the Bronx. As a black woman who has worn a uniform and a badge, I see this issue from all sides intimately. After witnessing the unthinkable acts of the Minnesota police officer, it's horrifying and disturbing to me because I know in my heart that the majority of the law enforcement officers who bravely put on their uniforms and their badges do not have hatred and murder on their mind or in their hearts. At the same time, as a Black woman raising a Black son, I understand that the risks and the dangers in the street are very real. My commitment to community service is what brought me to DCTV because through my work, I could be a part of a team that is committed to making a meaningful impact in the media. Knowing that DCTV shares my values for fighting bigotry and hatred speaks to the part of me that inspired me to become an auxiliary police officer, to do good and to serve my community. It's great to work in a place where I feel accepted and cared for. I have a voice, I have a story, I am DCTV. Hello, my name is Ijoma Carey, and I'm an 11th grader at Archbishop Carroll High School and a part of the Jim Vance Media Program. Although I'm not old enough to vote, I would like to encourage all of you who can to do so, because at the end of the day, you're determining my future, our future, and the future.
Can be the one percent to tie it all up. Go vote. Go vote. Go vote. This message has been approved. Even our young people are telling you just how important it is to vote. Before we move on, I'd like to thank Dr. Stephanie Myers for taking over the platform and handling things while we had our technical difficulties. So thank you, Dr. Myers. Now, as we present our next speaker, I must point out that we have been experiencing some technical difficulties with her video. So you'll probably just be hearing from her as opposed to seeing her. Please welcome the president, CEO, and founder of the Whole Genome Science Foundation Incorporated and the founding and former director of the National Human Genome Center at the Howard University College of Medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Georgia Dunstan, as she discusses an overview of human genome redemption. Dr. Georgia Dunstan. You're muted, Dr. Dunstan. Okay, just one second, stand okay, by. Just one second. Stand by. Sorry. As founder and president of Whole Genome Science Foundation, Inc., let me first thank and first thank acknowledge Dr. Stephanie acknowledge Myers for the opportunity to partner with Black Women for Positive Change in sponsoring this inaugural Indigenous Peoples Day webinar. When I was a, when I was when in I was When I was in school, October 12th was named Columbus Day, celebrating the story of Christopher Columbus' discovery of America in 1492. Today, this story of American history has been challenged by indigenous Native American peoples who say that Columbus's story negates the truth that indigenous Native American people were already here and living on the land when Columbus arrived. Their protests have led to the renaming of this day to the Indigenous Peoples Day to recognize the more complete reality of the existence and contributions of Native Americans to the nation's history. With this, let me begin with the first slide, a Ghanaian proverb which captures the key lesson of this webinar. Until the lions tell their own story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. The Ooh. symbol here is the symbol of the Ghanaian symbol for the supreme being, which leads me to the genome story, or shall I say the tale of our personal and population history revealed today by the supreme being and maker of the human genome through science and faith. Next slide. The sequencing of the human genome was completed in 2003 and it was considered by many as a wonder of modern science, a feat in biological science and technology comparable to putting a man on the moon and the launch of satellites into space. Like a satellite, the genome is an exquisite information and communication system equipped with the complete set of instructions for making and operating the human body that each of us inherits in DNA from each of our parents. As illustrated in this slide, the genome in the cell is involved in making all levels of biological 
organization from the cell to the whole individual to humanity itself, which is designed to work together in community to manifest the highest order of unbounded, unlimited life. Next slide. Thus the genome is about light expressed through biology, the science of life and living systems and identity, our inheritance revealed from the inside out. Moreover, it reveals the genome redemption story of human identity, population history, and global community encoded in our inheritance with no exemptions. Finally, the genome kingdom of God within is revealed by faith in the living word of the creator God and father of the whole human genome family on earth and in heaven. Last slide, please. In conclusion, science has revealed that less than 2% of our total genome inheritance is used in making the physical parts of the body, while 80% or more of it is involved in regulating and controlling behavior of the physical parts. Lastly, while the genome has been shown to encode phenomenal information on human history and ancestry, advances in the brain conditions of today are just beginning to scratch the surface of genomic data on human destiny and the future of life in space and in the universe. Thank you. It's muted. Dr. Ward, your mic's off. Okay, there's a reason my mic was off. And that's what I want to discuss with our listeners is that when someone is speaking, if your mic is open, it will cause that reverberation that we heard during Dr. Dunstan's presentation. So please, moving forward, please make sure you close your microphones if you are not speaking. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Dunstan. And now let's meet our next two finalists in the Harmony Jam contest, Deanna Duncan, followed by Stella Anane. Broken down and tired. Hi, my name is Deanna. I'm an 11th grade student in the Gym Dance Media Program at Archbishop Carroll High School in Washington, D.C. Contact me at my email, ddunchan 22 at achsdc.org. Or you can call me at 202-460-6853. Bullets on my back, chains on my wrist. Why does the world have to be like this? When I leave the house, I am no longer protected. I am seen as the world's biggest threat. To them, my skin is a weapon. We have been set back for hundreds of years. Even our ancestors had to go through this. Nothing was ever given to us until we begged and we plead. And even now, things aren't as fair as they seem. We must come together if we ever wish to succeed. Generation after generation, they try to tear our community apart. They'd rather kill us and leave us in the streets to bleed and cover up their wrongs with lies and schemes. We stand up for what we believe in peaceful protests with people from all different streams. They try to ruin our message and intertwine violence into our peace. Do black lives even matter to this society? All we want is to be free and to live with dignity. Hi, my name is Stella Anani. I'm in the ninth grade and today I'll be presenting a poem called Counting to 21 as written by me. One, two, three, four. These little girls deserve more. 
different than the others, but they bleed like one another. Shania, Latoya, and Monique, they all just wanted something to eat. Jason, Mike, and Tom told them that they didn't belong. Five, six, seven, eight. It's time for change before it's too late. Black, blue, red, green, and pink are all the same things. It is right to remember that we are better together and that no one lives forever. 9, 10, 11, 12. The world taught them to hate themselves. They were dragged from their ears to the ground. They stayed silent and made no sound. 13, 14, 15, 16 teenagers, just like me. Small, tall, dark, and light, afraid to step foot out at night. A monster, they called me as I walked down the street. All lies on me, and I can hear my own heartbeat. 17, 18, 19, 20. These are just a few cases out of many, leaving families devastated and unsteady. The wrong accusation made because of their race. Treated like they didn't deserve to have a safe place. They were denied the right to live to see another day. Now society thinks that it's okay. 21 seconds, minutes, and hours all gone to waste. They haunt me even when I'm awake. My color, a blessing, but mistaken as a curse. In a world full of hate, everyone has their own fate. Color does not choose and humanity should not refuse. Thank you for listening. I'm Jackie, the Master Control Coordinator at DCTV. In addition to my work at DCTV, I'm also an attorney, which is the career I had before coming to DCTV. In the words of Congressman Alcee Hastings, all lives can't matter unless Black lives matter. The framers of the Constitution did not intend to include people of African descent, indigenous people of this land, and women as citizens of the United States of America. Over time, the Constitution was amended, treaties were formed, and laws were adopted to address this exclusion. Unfortunately, hatred and bigotry still pervades in every aspect of American life. The recent uprising of citizens of elevated consciousness of every race, sex, religion, socioeconomic, and educational backgrounds was triggered by the continuous killing of Black people by police. The issue of police brutality against Black people is not a new one. What is different today is that ordinary people are now equipped with the technology to become citizen journalists and record what is going on at the hands of the police. The world is able to see the disparity and brutality firsthand. And we are seeing that this is a global pandemic, no different than COVID-19. Black people are being killed disproportionately and unnecessarily at the hands of the police. I came to DCTV over 20 years ago because this is an organization that gives the community and me the opportunity to exercise our First Amendment right to free speech. The same passion that I have for justice inspires me to do the work that I do at DCTV. I have a voice, I have a story. I am DCTV. Duggan, an 11th grader at Archbishop Carroll High School and Dr. Ward's practicum class, and this message has been approved. Every year I'm always empty, except on November 3rd. November 3rd is election day, but recently my box hasn't gotten as full as it usually gets. Every year voters are voting less and less. We need to change that. We need to go out and vote so my voters box can be overfilled. With voting season coming up, this is the time for our voices to be heard. Go out and vote for the best person that represents your voice. Do your research on these people because they will be in charge of your country for the next four years.
go out and vote to earn your own voter sticker. Don't forget, get out and vote. This is a crucial election and we need to affect change if we want to see changes in the policies in our country with racism and violence and systemic police brutality. Also, remember to participate in the survey link that's in the chat box as well as at the bottom of the screen. You've been hearing students from the Archbishop Carroll High School Jim Vance Media Program, which I have the honor of being the director. So it's been a privilege today for you to hear their voices, our young people, their voice and their vision. And now we'll hear from our next speaker, Dr. Barbara Reynolds. She is an ordained minister, chaplain for Black Women for Positive Change Incorporated, a civil rights activist, journalist, and author. Today, Dr. Reynolds will discuss faith-based wisdom in the age of DNA technology and AI. AI is artificial intelligence. Dr. Reynolds. Well, thank you, Dr. Ward. I'm excited about being here today. I come as a journalist who, for four years, I've been out researching my eighth forthcoming book, the rise of the techno messiah, which is a culture so entrenched in worshiping technology, they are on the verge of inventing an artificial intelligence god. I didn't start out that way. My self assignment was go to the leading tech and science institutions, churches, universities, and to congressional hearings to evaluate the presence and impact of God. So during a tour of Silicon Valley, I stood on the roof of the Apple headquarters that was shaped like a spaceship. And from that high perch, I saw places that, was sh that were, were piled with thousands of people, homeless, sleeping on the street. But the tech companies did not see them. I didn't see God in that. I went to Google. And I saw a memo of 10 reasons why since Google was everywhere and knew everything, Google was God. I went to MIT, an education leader in artificial intelligence to examine their robots there. And one of their top scientists suggests that people should pay their tithes to tech companies instead of churches because the companies were doing more for humans than God. I went to congressional hearings and I heard bold plans on how bioengineering and DNA manipulation could help create a race of superhumans, which we wouldn't be a part of. But, but I thank God that in the midst of my journey, I met Dr. George Dunstan, a brilliant scientist and a woman of great faith who anchors genetics in divine revelation and purpose. I believe that we can't bring a moral voice to counter many of the inequities that plague us as strongly as any virus. I believe that we can create good science. That's why I always include scriptures on in my, uh, in my talk to remind our faith community that our body is sacred and should not be the playpen for people playing God. Nevertheless, my very soul is weary today because of how bad politics is bullying and creating bad science, contributing to more than the, um, to, to many of the 200,000 deaths to COVID-19 so far. The latest polls show that four out of 10 of us distrust the Centers for Disease Control, and nearly half of us would not take any vaccine coming from the Trump administration. And can you blame us for not trusting someone who once suggested disinfectants could cure COVID-19? 19. 
there is a crying need for an infusion of moral and ethical outcomes, which leads me to my first concerns, and that's robots. Thousands of humanoid robots that look, talk, and some can think like humans are being manufactured. Now, many of them tutor our children, go to nursing homes, even in Japan run whole, whole hotels. That's okay. But others are being used as sex bots to fuel the billion dollar sex industry. These are not the kind of dolls we grew up with. These have sexual parts that look and perform exactly like those of humans. And they are child bots designed like children to satisfy the lust of pedophiles. And female sex bots treated as objects will only increase violence against women and child bots will fuel the passion of pedophiles to abuse children. What angers me, and I've discussed this with Dr. Dunstan, is that we have the God-breathed authentic body used as a model for artificial bodies used for pornographic entertainment. That should be an issue for the church folks. Robotic job placement is a serious issue Violence, racism, or the seeds of discontent all wrapped up in this fast-moving reality. By 2030, automation and robotics reportedly it will take 20 million jobs globally. When you consider that robots work without pay, no coffee breaks, no vacations, health insurance, who do you think will be more valued, the human worker or the robot? Millions of robots, fake people, will be more valued than the poor or people of color without skills. We must push for vigorous retraining programs because without them, many will become casualties of violence and the prison pipeline. My second point is against, again, speaks of the consequence of bad science and bad politics. It is a recent allegation that people, that doctors were performing illegal, unnecessary hysterectomies on women of color against their will in custody of the US Immigration Service. This is a ripe example of what can happen when bad science and bad politics comes together without the moral and ethical voices needed to combat this. The white evangelists who say their main reason for supporting Trump is because of his anti-abortion stand right to life. But they say nothing about women being forced to lose their rights to fertility permanently. I don't know if any religious groups came to their aid, but I do know that this issue was raised to the media and to Congress by Dr. Valda Crowder and she is a physician and chair of our Black Women for Positive Change Health Committee, along with Dr. Myers. This is an excellent example for the faith community to follow. This is a crucial, important issue because these allegations draw a comparison to America's ugly history of Hitler like eugenics, which is scientific racism. Between 1907 and 1937, two thirds of US states passed laws that allowed the sterilization of more than 60,000 women, many of whom were women of color against their will. Now with a white supremacist president at our helm, we cannot trust science and technology with bad politics to protect the bodies of women of color and others nor can we protect our general well-being with this kind of president. Genocidal policies could be a step away. I could share many more issues with you, but I do have to commend Dr. Dunstan, my mentor, and Dr. Myers and all the other panelists on calling their attention to some of the most important but neglected issues of our age. As our rep representative John Lewis told us, if you see something wrong, do something, cause good trouble. His words are speaking to us now to create 
good science. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds. Now, before we go to our finalists for the Poetry Jam, I just want to remind you to write your questions in the chat box. This is an interactive community discussion. And so far, we've got no questions. We'd like to hear from you. Write your questions in the chat box. Make sure you identify yourself so that we can identify you and the panelists to whom your question is directed. Also, you've heard some of the students talk about the Jim Vance Media Program here at Archbishop Carroll High School. That's where we're filming this program from. The Jim Vance Media Program at Archbishop Carroll High School is an elite program for high school students to experience the media and journalism profession. So what you don't know is behind the scenes today, our student journalists are interviewing our panelists and our poetry finalists. So let's now meet another finalist in the Harmony Jam contest. Welcome, Cassidy Ald. My name is Cassidy Ald. I'm an 11th grader and I attend Archbishop Carroll High School in Washington, DC. This is my poem, A Windowsill. A virus, a virus. She turns the news off and walks away. It's happening across the sea. It won't ever touch her or me. It's in the air. It's in the air. How far could it travel from there to here? Not possible, not happening. More cases confirmed by the day. She locks her door at night and prays two months later. Two months later. Oh, it's gotten worse. Some people call it a pandemic. She calls it a curse. Those ones alive, now dead. Death waiting at her door. She puts on her mask, preparing for war. No food. No food. The shelves are empty. She grabs what she can and goes. Rides in the streets, and injustice around every corner, but she takes one step at a time. Make it home. Finally, home. Time stops on a dime, ripping off her mask like a thief guilty of a crime. As life, I watch her live on repeat, seeing her move from bed to the kitchen, then back to bed, but she may never know it is I on the windowsill. Hello, my name is Manning Hall, a 12th grade student at Archbishop Carroll High School and the practicum course within the Jim Vance Media Program. As we all know, the 2020 election is slowly approaching, and this is a very crucial election for many. This year's candidates are Donald Trump and Mike Pence, and also Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the first African-American woman to be the Democratic nominee for vice president. This election year, it is important that everyone, especially our youth, get out and vote. There is a thought going around that your vote doesn't matter and voting is pointless, but your vote does matter. So make sure you get out and vote in November. Every vote counts. Thank you for listening and this message has been approved. <laughs>right get out and vote listen to our young people now in as much as i've said we don't have any questions with all of the student reporters we have from my classes of course make sure you ask questions as well now we're going to move on to dr Vanessa seal founder and ceo bomb in gilead incorporated and home of the healthy churches 2020 national conferences she will discuss science-based knowledge and faith-based wisdom in the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Seal. Well, thank you. Thank you so very, very much and so happy to be a part of this very important conversation. Science-based knowledge and faith-based wisdom in the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic. We are in a very interesting place in space where we are, the political landscape has divided us with what is science and what is not science. 
And oftentimes we are always struggling with our faith versus medicine. How do we get here? How do we wrestle with, you know, for so many of us, I'm just going to pray my way through it. I'm not going to take my medicine. I'm not even going to wear a mask. I'm not going to wear a mask because, you know, Jesus, the Lord is going to protect me. You know, there is wisdom that we must always remember that the scripture, the scripture gives us wisdom, wisdom and faith and science really in my life are the same. Because the Bible says, as a man, as a woman, thinketh in her heart, so is she. How have we gotten here in this place? How have we gotten here? I think that for all of us, for those of us who are believers, we have a tremendous responsibility to spread the good news that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And God gives us science. God gives us medicine. He gives us doctors. I'm always thinking about how fast time is moving. Every day, I'm racing against time. It seems like Monday, today is Monday, and I'm racing against Friday. And the earth is just spinning. It's spinning on its ask axis. And it's just spinning. And yet the love of God, gravity, keeps us grounded. And who, we don't even feel that we're spinning. Really, it feels like I'm spinning. My life is spinning out of control. But God's gravity really keeps me grounded. We're in the middle of this pandemic with a virus that we cannot see. We cannot see it. We can't taste it. We can't see it. But we can surely feel its impact. We can surely feel its impact. And if we are so blessed to not to get this virus, we can so thankfully, thankful, help those who may get it. Because they too can't see it but they can feel the impact. And so many, too many, over 200,000 Americans have made their transition because of this unseen virus. But the unseen virus is just like our unseen faith. For the Bible says, once again, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. So when we are looking at science, when we're looking at medicine, it is the evidence of things hoped for. I'm going to take my medicine. I am going to go to the doctor that God has made and ordained in the human beings to be in alignment with science. It is the evidence it is the evidence of my faith that I emerge with science. We're in an interesting time, again. And those of us who are believers, those of us who are believers, I think our voices are needed more now than any time in history. In history. You know, when we were, when I was growing up in Charleston, South Carolina, so many, many years ago as a colored child, as a colored girl in the segregated South, I did not have the voice that I have now. I also believed that I had to die to go to Jerusalem. I didn't know there was actually a place called Jerusalem. I believe that I was taught that I had to cross the Jordan River when I die. I did not know that there was actually a Jordan River that I can get on a plane and go to. But knowledge, knowledge and understanding brings, gives me responsibility to spread the good news. And the good news is that nothing can separate me from the love of God. And the good news is that 
science and wisdom lives together. Science and my faith lives together. Because the matter of fact, science is my faith. Faith is my science. If I believe, if I believe that God in me, that through the Christ within me, I can do and be all things, that is science and that is my faith. I cannot touch my faith, but I can believe. I can believe, and it is what I believe that makes it real. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I thank God for all of the scientists. I used to be an immunologist uh, and studying cancer research and ma malaria research and always in the lab trying to figure out something something, toxoplasmosis, something I could not see. But it is through my faith that makes my science real. And it is through the science, the universe, the consciousness, the consciousness of God that twirls science that makes it real in my heart and in my soul. So those of us who are believers in this time, we must speak, we must speak power that science and faith, they live together, not just in my heart and soul, but in the universe. In the universe, there is no difference between science and faith because science is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share. Thank you, Dr. Seal. I hope all of you are participating in the survey. Remember, we'll be posting the link at the bottom of the screen as well as in the chat room. Speaking of which, we've got lots of questions coming in now. So now let's meet another finalist in the Harmony Jam contest. Welcome, Bianca Ward Washington. Where am I as I sit confined? What could I be doing passing my mind? What do I miss from the days in the After past? The Trying to remember why every that moment lasts. Speak, I could take, huh? Was it the fresh air in my lungs I once breathed with joy? Or the games with friends <laughs> who used to annoy? Could it have been the flips and tricks we did to impress? The outfits, silly and all, we used to dress? Memories, emotions flooding back in my head. Reality sets in, bringing along its dread. As I finally realize where I am, I fight back the demons. Kick, scream, slam. The world is in battle, just like me. Hiding behind a mask for no one to see. Fighting an illness, confused, misled. It's best for you and society, they said. We sit here hopeless as time ticks by, waiting for the day we're free from our ties, tired, anxious, out of our minds, drifting into thought, sitting confined. Hi, I am Keith Archer, a 12th grade student that attends Archbishop Carroll High School. I am a part of Dr. Ward's practicum course and also part of the Vance Media Program. These are pictures of people who have went out and voted. Voting is important for multiple reasons. I don't have to Getting out and voting is important because you get to go out and show well, who and what you believe in. This message has been approved, and goodbye and thank you from Archbishop Carroll High School. Thank you, Dr. Seal. I hope all of you are participating in our survey. Before we go to our next presenter, I'd also like to say hello to a few of my colleagues here at Archbishop Carroll High School who have joined us. The other thing that you don't know that has also been happening as a result of this fascinating webinar 
is that Archbishop Carroll High School has a ACHS curriculum collaboration team, and some of them are with us today. They make up Mr. Tom Folletti, Mr. Rich Vitale, Ms. Charlene Howard, Ms. Sonia Wilson, Mr. Juco, Ms. Celine Serene Khalid, Mr. Kenny Lee, and myself. So thank you to my colleagues here at Archbishop Carroll High School who have been creating some amazing curriculum as a result of today's discussion. Now, our next presenter is a root psychologist, author, lecturer, researcher, and founder of the Institute of African-Centered Thought. Welcome, Dr. Orisade Awadola, to discuss faith and science-based knowledge of African-centered thought on racism and violence. Dr. Awadola. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Dr. Ward, you have done such an exquisite um, job in pulling us together and it's so needed and I so appreciate it. It's just such a very heart touching um, experience to be here with everyone. I, I'd like to begin with saying a Yoruba proverb, no one can uproot the tree which God has planted. The questions that has been going forward is, what is the root of violence? As a root psychologist, and I may be able to get to how that came about, but when I was working clinical, it wasn't working. It needed more to work with, with the clients that I had at Hillcrest Children's Center and Federal City Recovery Services in Washington, D.C. And I also studied and worked at the Washington Institute of Psychiatry uh, in conjunction with training with PIW on Wisconsin Avenue. I want to start with saying this. In order to understand the root of violence, we have to understand the root of its origin. And when I talk about origin, I'm saying that Black people history did not begin in slavery, but the trauma did. So the root of violence and racism is rooted in trauma and it's depicted through thought disorders, which it brings me to the scripture in Romans uh, 12 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. I chose that because I'm going to briefly go to Henry Berry's speech in, to the Virginia Assembly and Virginia legislature, legislators in 1832 after the Nat Turner insurrection. And if anyone needs this uh, public document, I, I let me know in the chat or let Dr. Ward know and I will get it to you. But I'm just going to read a, a, a few of what it's a few lines of what it says. Pass as severe laws as you will to keep these unfortunate creatures in ignorance. It is in vain unless you can extinguish that part of intellect which God has given them. Sir, we have closed every possible avenue by which light may enter their minds. We have one step to go further to extinguish their capacity to see the light and know the God within them, and then they will be reduced to the beast of the field, and we will be safe. And then he will not be able to know that he is She's muted. Dr. Olo, Awadola, you muted. Where did I leave off at? 
You heard nothing I said? You heard what you said, probably a sentence or two back, maybe two sentences back. We're talking about the beast in the field. Yes. Okay. This is from legislator introduced in 1832 before the uh, assembly in Virginia. That they should be reduced to the beast of the field and we shall be saved. So that even in the midst of freedom, he will not know that he is free. That brings me to the scripture in Hosea 4, 6. My people suffer because of lack of knowledge. And we, we have to understand that and understand that unless there is a renewal of the mind, that the freedom comes from within. But first, you have to have a renewal of the mind. And how this connects with the genome. Because the genome is God. Because God created everything. And that's a deeper conversation. But to look at that scripture and understand that John tells us in John 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was God. God is the word. Because what we speak, we create. So it's one thing to continue talking about what has happened or what the white man has done. But that's not, that's not the solution. The solution is understanding and reclaiming our divine selves from within in order to move forward collectively as people and lean not, as Proverbs tells us, to your Proverbs 3, 5, to your own understanding, but acknowledge God in all thy ways, whatever you believe. The proverb is, and God will direct that path. Science and faith is one. It's only separate for those that are not spiritually grounded. And that brings me to the thought disorders, which is why I'm speaking about it, because in the DSM, there is a criteria that talks about thought disorders. And thought disorders is also uh, a syndrome. It's, it's, a, it's a process that the DSM describes poverty of thought, content, speech, and ideas. So when we understand what that means, it understands what Cart uh, Samuel Cartwright did in 1856, all during the heightened time of slavery. Then we can understand how to not undo it, but move with and through it. That's how you address any challenge or barriers in life. First, you have to understand what happened there is no blame game, but in order to develop systems or create or co-create systems to help move through it. And that's what root psychology is. And that's how the ancestral healing identity theory that I developed came about. And that brings me, excuse me, but that brings me to Dr. Georgia Dunstan. I was so excited and Dr. James Savage recommended that I contact her. I was so excited that this was a black phenomenal woman who was a scientist. He had the answer to my prayer. I understand ancestral healing and how it came about, but I did not have the science to put with it because as you all know in research, the, that is a barrier for black researchers because spirituality or what cannot be tested is irrelevant, which is what's missing in the research. But Dr. Dunstan brought the genome to life. And even though this is not the conversation I have, we are having a conference next year, which you'll hear more about on this, but I would just like to say, in closing, 
And I'm so very grateful to have this sacred moment to share that. It is about us respecting and understanding. When you don't know, does not mean it does not exist. Because one of the exercises, and this I will close with, is to challenge you all to grab the air, hold it in your hands, and look at it. What do you see? Nothing. That's how we have to move through this. You don't see it, but you know it exists because you're breathing. And that's the same kind of knowingness that you have to have that was spoken on earlier about faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things unseen. Thank you so very much and peace to you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Awadola. And now, before we take our next two finalists, thank you so much for all of the great questions you submitted. So now we're not taking any more questions. And now we are gonna move forward with our next two finalists, Janiah Hollis-Tuck and Aracelis Echeverria. Hi, my name is Janiah Hollis-Tuck. And today I'm gonna to be talking about what it's like to be black and white in America. This is what it's like to be black and white in America. In elementary school, they told us to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It seems it's only liberty and justice for them, not everyone else. That's the way America is built though. The system is rigged. It was never built for blacks. It was built for white people. They benefit from it. They love our culture, but they don't love us. Discrimination is an ongoing issue in the American workplaces. Black women wear box braids, hoop earrings, and long nails. They're fired from their jobs because it's too ghetto. But when white women wear it, they're praised for it. It just feels like being black in America is a crime. Black people are getting longer sentences for crimes and white people are getting little to no sentences for the crimes they commit. George Floyd, a black man, he was unarmed and he was killed over a counterfeit $20 bill. Breonna Taylor, a black woman, killed in a police raid while she was sleeping before they broke into her house. She was also unarmed. Kyle Rittenhouse, a white teenager who was armed, killed two protesters. The police saw him. He walked past him with them gun. He walked past them with the gun, and they cheered him on as he walked away. Not to mention that some people think he's innocent. This is what it's like being black and white in America. Thank you for listening to my poem, and have a nice day. Hello, my name is Aracelis Echeverria, and I am in the 12th grade and I attend Archbishop Curl High School. And my poetry will be about living in COVID-19. COVID-19, something unexpected, a disease that has every lives affected. Quarantine is here, feels like everything disappeared. Many have died, many are infected, and many have yet to be diagnosed and detected. Wear a mask, cover your coughs, don't be the factor of passing the cost. Everyday life as we known it has changed and all I see is people passing the blame. Many are turning and raging, but we should be united, not frightened. They don't want to end up catching the virus, suffering and giving their last breath, but life as we know it brings us fear and doubt, which causes us to panic and flip our hope upside down. All are anxious, all are immensely worried, for most of their dear ones are now buried. The news gets worse as death rates increase. In so much chaos, it is a luxury to have peace. 
With so much uncertainty in this world today, I am grateful to wake up and see another day. Thank you. I'm Michelle, Member Services Coordinator at DCTV. I stand against racism and bigotry because they're wrong. My greatest concern is for future generations and the lessons we're teaching them. For change to happen, we have to start at the most basic level of society, which is family, because many of us value that the most. We all wanna see our families prosper and be great citizens of the world. We all are human beings in this journey of life together. And of course, all lives matter. However, black lives are disproportionately endangered due to hate, brutality, and violence. Systemic racism still has a devastating and generational impact on the black family. My first awareness of when my skin color was an issue in society was when I was about age six or seven. Since my toddler years, my family and I would take an annual summer vacation. One year, my sister and I were so excited to play with a neighboring family's granddaughter. She happened to be white, and we first met her and played with her the summer before. During the returning summer, our playmate told us that she could no longer play with us. When we asked why, she said it was because we were Black. In the span of one year, our playmate had been taught racism and how to spread it. That was a painful experience that's still with me today. Parents shouldn't have to have the talk with children so young to explain racism, but it's still a reality in the Black family today. Working at DCTV, I can leverage my voice for change. Knowing that I'm part of an organization that shares my values and desire to stand against racism and hate is very rewarding. So I'm raising my voice to speak up for change, hoping that the next generation can live in a better world. Our children are watching. I have a voice. I have a story. I am DCTV. Morning. My name is Corbin Flaherty, and I am a junior at Archbishop Carroll High School. Although I am too young to exercise the right to vote, I am here as a messenger for my community to tell you to vote. With much controversy in our country right now, it is important for you to decide who you think would best lead our nation to success. Both sides have their fair share of controversy. However, it is your job to decide who you think will best represent your ideals and morals better. On one side, you have the Republican candidate, Donald Trump, who is our current president. On the other side, Joe Biden is a Democratic candidate who previously worked under President Obama. As a citizen, it is only right for you to research these candidates and make a small decision, which is part of a larger choice. We as a country make this choice and we will be impacted by it for four years, not counting the lasting effect. With this being said, do what you believe is right. Get out there and vote. Keep in mind, it is important to vote. Before we open up the floor to some of your fantastic questions, there's a few other people we'd like to thank here at Archbishop Carroll High School. We'd definitely like to thank the president, Mr. Larry Savoy, the vice president, Mr. Mark Savrical, the principal, Alana Gilmore, the vice principal, Kristen Jackson Nesmith, and the academic dean, Ms. Melanie Powell, the director of athletics, Mr. Brian Ellerby, and the assistant director of athletics, Mr. Robert Harris. Also, we'd like to thank the Archbishop Carroll High School faculty and staff for helping to support and carry off this event. So now let's hear from our last two semifinalists in the Harmony Jam contest, David Okechukwu and Zenobia Bay Bray. 
Hi, my name is David Obachuku. I am in 11th grade. I go to our Bishop Carroll High School. And the poem that I chose to write about was COVID-19. COVID-19, it was pretty unpredictable. Definitely contact reachable. I'm about to get teachable to the virus. Killing people every single day. Mask after mask got me six feet away. Lord, I call and Lord, I pray that this virus goes away. People losing families, having to go medical. It's a sad case when Trump unprofessional. But meanwhile, COVID's still here. Been in a pandemic for almost a year. Man, I'm tired for all these tears. People losing faith and having fear. One thing I know is we're going to overcome. We the next generation. So it's time to pick it up and run. Twenty twenty has never been so blurry. Yep. Sweet. It started clear. A new beginning in bloom, all demolished by unforeseen disease. The dreaded plague. The ones we love. The ones we support. The year we once had a vision starts to become foggy. Miscommunicated promises. The world in a bubble. We are trapped. Lies. Rumors and disbelief. The place we once knew as a union has split. Not too long after, another plague came. Plague rooted for the last 600 years. Injustices, violence, and pain. An ongoing cycle of pain. Trayvon, Eric, Sandra, George, Brianna. Cities fall to shambles. Comrades turn against one another. No victory to come. 2020 has never been so blurry. I'm Angela, and I'm Vice President of Community Engagement, Programming, and Communications at DCTV. I stand against hate and bigotry. Prior to coming to DCTV, my experience included work as a university professor and the chair of the Journalism and Media Studies Department at major universities. One of the most impactful courses that I've taught has been the study of race, gender, and class in the media. The medium of television, like movies, print, radio, and digital, is incredibly powerful. Our social norms are accepted or rejected based on what we see and hear in media. Voices of the powerless are often marginalized, and too often, they are silenced. This speaks to the importance of community media. DCTV gives voice to the voiceless. We provide an open platform for all to be heard. We want the voices of black, brown, yellow, white, LGBTQ, different abilities and religions all to be heard. As an employer, we have a zero tolerance for discrimination and hate. As a leader in business and as a humanitarian, I feel a personal responsibility to bring new ideas and innovation that will create change. That only happens through diversity. Every perspective matters. Inclusion means everyone. Black Lives Matter is not an exclusion of anyone. It's a movement against brutality and hate. This is a time for us to work together towards equality and change. I have a voice, I have a story, and I am DCTV. Hi, my name is Taylor Williams Odom, and I'm a junior at Archbishop Carroll High School. Growing up in a world where it is important to voice your own opinions and not being able to legally is very difficult. So I come to you today to tell you, as a messenger from the younger generation, to go out and cast your votes today. With everything that is going on in our world, it is very important that you decide who you would think will be best to lead our nation into a better tomorrow. There will be many pros and cons within each candidate chosen. 
It will be your job during the selection to decide who you think best represents your own beliefs. The candidates for this year's voting election are Republican Donald Trump, who is our current president, and Democrat Joe Biden, who previously worked in the White House under President Barack Obama. As a citizen of the United States of America, it is your duty to go out and do further research on these two candidates, and your decision will be a big part of what today's tomorrow will look like for all of us. With everything that has been said, go out and vote and make a change for the better. This message has been approved. Yes, please do get out and vote. While we are preparing to announce our top three finalists in the Harmony Jam Poetry Slam contest, we're going to ask our panelists to respond to some of the questions you have submitted. So to our esteemed panelists, I'm gonna ask you all this question as I direct you by calling your name. The question is, could each of you leave three takeaways that you would like attendees to have from your talks? So let's start with our first speaker, Dr. Stephanie Myers. Okay, the three takeaways that I would suggest that people uh, consider, the comments that were made about science and faith, I thought were extremely important. So I would encourage people to get the document that Dr. Owadala uh, offered. Uh, also, I hope that they will research into the root causes of violence in uh, white Americans as well as black Americans. We don't want to just stop with the black. And the third takeaway would be the importance of an intergenerational workshop like the one we have had today. Hearing the thoughts of the young people and the older people together is a wonderful, wonderful contribution. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Myers. Dr. Dunstan, would you please address the three takeaways that you would like to see listeners take away from your talk? Dr. Dunstan? I think maybe Dr. Dunstan is still having some technical difficulty at this time. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. My apologies, I was on mute. Um, yes, I would like the audience to take away that the genome is God made. It is the creation of God and it is information on who we are, how God made us to be. It is knowledge and information. Science at its best is a search for truth. Faith is also a basis of truth. The per what I would want to focus on science as was said and the science and faith work together. And it's interesting that in the only religion that I, the, <laughs> this is key. For me, Christianity is the only religion where the center focus of the faith defines himself as truth. For Jesus Christ says, I am the truth. Therefore, it is a faith which would appeal to both science, which is a search for truth, and faith, which is a demonstration of truth. So the takeaway point is God has come now through science of the genome to educate and teach us about who we are, how he made us to be. And science has taken us to the borders of the seen and the unseen. If you drill down, we come to quantum reality. If you drill up, we come to space and the universe. And each of those domains are areas for knowing who we are. And that's Thank the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Dunstan. And now, Dr. Reynolds, could you respond? Dr. Reynolds, would you please unmute your mic? Thank you. You're welcome. I'm, going, I'm a journalist, and I'm always going to to be a journalist and my faith inspires me to, to get involved in between science and politics. 
so that there <laughs> indeed can be good science. However, when I look out and, and smell the air, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's who, uh, what, what communities you know, have pollution is based on you know, your, your politics. And so uh, when I look at, um, at this, this, this virus that we have, you know, I'm seeing uh, people dying. I mean, science isn't bad, but when politics gets into the science, then you have bad science. So, um, you know, I will always look, I guess, for the flaws. Um, I'm a trained journalist, and, uh, you know, when, when all the planes take off, that, that's, that's uh, good, but I will look at what one didn't. So, but I am so impressed by, by Dr. Dunstan, who has sat with me for hours to help me see more faith in science. And I'm not there yet, like like she is, but I'm I'm getting I'm getting there, and I and impressed by uh, all of the speakers, but I am still uh, uh, trying to make science behave. <laughs> well, we are all works in progress. At okay. this time, we'd like to hear from Dr. Pranessa Seal. Dr. Seal. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. The takeaways that I would like to offer um, are that as we, as you continue uh, to, as you begin your your life journey, uh, that you would root yourself in a few um, a few a, a few foundations that have helped me tremendously. One is that God is spirit. So and they that worship God must also, worship God not on you. and in truth. I'm going to say that again. That you would ground your life in some fundamental truth. That God is spirit, not a man or a woman, but God is spirit. And they that worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. The second grounding is through Christ within you through Christ within you, that you can do and be all things, that get a connection with Christ that lives and breathes in and through you. And third, as a man or a woman thinketh, so is that man or woman in his or her heart. As you thinketh in your heart, there you are. Those are my three takeaways. Thank you so much, Dr. Seal. And finally, we'd like to hear Dr. Awadola's takeaway that she'd like for our attendees to take from her presentation. Before you speak, make sure your mic is unmuted, Dr. Awadola, and please respond. Well, there's, you know, there's, for me, <clears throat> what I would say is the, uh, to walk in integrity, knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom is a matter of unveiling what you know. It's the Christ in you. <clears throat> Understand that Jesus, Jesus' name changed from Jesus of Nazareth to Jesus Christ, because Christ is about the awakening of the inner divine one. And John tells us the kingdom of God is within. You can't get to the Father, a higher consciousness, but through the Son, which is the Word. Because in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and God is the word. And you can only honor God in spirit and truth. For no man hath ever seen the face of God. And God is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. So today is always yesterday, and today is always tomorrow. And in that is why I say to walk in integrity and wisdom and truth. And the only way you can do that is to know thyself. Before you begin anything, you have to go, whatever that is that works for you. I've recommended people take the book of Proverbs and read one every day. Develop a relationship with God. You have to have the me time to become spiritually grounded. That's the number one, two, three. 
that I leave you with. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Awadola. Well, we're gonna try to take one more question and be brief panelists in your response. Dr. Dunstan and Dr. Seal. We're gonna start with Dr. Seal first and end with Dr. Dunstan. Briefly, please. How did you learn or gain the deeper understanding of faith since you're already so deeply rooted in science? Dr. Seal, please address the question. Well, interesting that you would uh, ask that question. Um, my, uh, my godmother in, in, in my new understanding just made her transition this morning, the mm -hmm. Reverend Dr. Barbara King of Hillside International Truth Center uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, as I said earlier, I was uh, from Lincolnville, South Carolina, and uh, grew up in a, a rural town and with, with older black folk. And it was all about, you know, we're going to walk in Jerusalem, just like John. Uh, and when I went to college and took a religion class, you know, and realized that some of that stuff they were teaching wasn't quite um, right, I just got upset. Um, and went on my own quest, my own quest to find out how this, how this thing really works. I'm born into, uh, into this consciousness. I'm born into this earth and one day I'm gonna leave. Uh, and I remember going to, uh, someone suggested um, that I go to Hillside and Dr. Barbara King said, um, uh, you, one day you will, you will come to understand, we will all come to understand that the God, the only God that there is, is the God within us. And it, it messed me up, really, because I had never heard that before. And she introduced me to the Reverend Dr. Johnny Coleman in Chicago, Illinois, who taught me metaphysics, who I, I, I'm just blessed and honored that I had the opportunity to sit at Reverend Dr. Johnny Coleman's feet and was taught. And I think that, you know, um, the, the, the concept of how to live uh, through life, uh, how to think and how to process and, and how to know that all things is of God, it has to be taught. It just doesn't drop out of uh, the sky. And that's why I say that those of us who have been blessed with knowledge, we have a responsibility to teach it and to pass it on. Um, and, and that's what's so key, uh, so key for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Seal. Dr. Dunstan, as we are quickly running out of time, please briefly respond to the question in your views, um, how your deeper understanding of faith um, became so deep and you are already so deeply rooted in science. Your brief remarks. Thank you. As a child, I had lots of questions for God about what I was learning in Sunday school. Questions about God, why did you make me the way you made me? Why, am I, why did you make me black? Why, or at that time, why did you make me a colored girl? Why did you make me a girl? I was looking at my world and I saw certain advantages that people that were not like me had that I didn't have. And yet in Sunday school, I learned that God loved us all the same. But to me, it looked like God loved some of his children a little bit better than he loved others. I asked my Sunday school teachers, I asked my pastor, and I asked my mother constantly, mom, why God made me X, Y, Z? My mother, one day in her frustration said to me, Georgia May, I do not know why God made you a girl. I do not know why God made you colored. I do not know why he gave you kinky hair. But I tell you what, Georgia May, you ask God why he made you the way he made you. And I wanted to just tell that story as a backdrop because that's exactly what I did as a child. I asked God why he made me the way he made me and how does it show his love for me? As a consequence, God led me along an, a path, an academic path that led me all the way through the academic realm to get a PhD in the science of human genetics because this was the area that I thought I would get answers to 
why God made me. God led me, and let me fast forward and just said, from the academic realm, a career where he took me to a point in time where the Human Genome Project was being the biggest biological research area that in, in, uh, in, in our time, looking at the human genome. Following okay. my question, just, just, just very, quick, very quickly here, I just wanted to say that the purpose of this webinar is to make a distinction, to make a point that science is like a Thomas, what I call a Thomas ministry. It, the, the science of genomics is like God coming to us in our time, talking to us through a language, science, that we respect and we revere. But he's answering questions about who we are and what he made us to be. He's asking us how we answer the question, who do you say I am? Because oh. science is now teaching us that who we say we are is instruction to our genome. And it's powerful because this genome has been created and made possible to produce whatever we say. And oh. science shows us that. And that's the time that we're living in. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Dunstan. I hope all of our panelists and guests have gleaned a remarkable amount of information, knowledge, and wisdom from this webinar. So before we move on and introduce the top three winners in the poetry contest, I'd like to give special thanks to Dr. Barbara Parks Lee, who had the task of reviewing and judging the entries for the Harmony Jam Spoken Word Poetry Slam. She is an author, a scholar, and a teacher. As a Carnegie Scholar and Fellow, she earned the District of Columbia's first National Board Certification in English Language Arts in 1997. So at this time, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Barbara Parks Lee. Ms. Lee, would you like to say a few things? It was an extremely pleasurable but hard job because there were so many quality issues. Being a member of the fountain pen generation, I was overwhelmed by the technology, the skill, and the thoughtfulness of the students who participated. I want to be in your class. And I thank you for asking me to please look at the entries. The students are phenomenal. And Thank just so you know, uh, Dr. Barbara Parks Lee is one of my former teachers and mentors. So thank you so much. So now the moment we've all been waiting for, the announcement of our top winners for $500 in cash prizes. So in third place for $100, drum roll please. Can we get a drum roll? Okay. Okay, I think we got a little bit. Our third place winner is Deanna Duncan. Our second place winner, Maxwell May. And last but not least, in first place, the winner is, drum roll please, our first place winner for $250 is Ijoma Okire. Ijoma. Ijoma. <laughs> How do you feel, Ijoma? I feel great. Thank you. It was nice to, you know, display my work. Congratulations. Well, Ijoma is also a Vance Scholar, so I'm very proud of you, Ijoma. And to all of the entrants, I'm super proud of you, to our winners. So before we close, there's a message I'd like to give you. As we look at the pandemics of 2020, racism, violence, and COVID-19, there's something I'd like to leave you with. Milk it. Life is short. You must put into it all that you want to get. But if you find your station in life, milk it, dig down deep, soul search, 
evaluate the odds, weigh the circumstances, and you'll find it's not as hard as you think. If you but try, realize there is no limit. You can touch the sky and soar. There's so much more to life than day-to-day -day existence. No matter what one achieves, there's always an expense, a price to pay. Remembering what you give is what you get. But if you find your station in life, look it. Thank you so much for joining us this inaugural defining event celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day as an integral component of the Black Women for Positive Change, ninth annual week of health empowerment, nonviolence, and opportunities from the 18th of October through the 20th in partnership with the Whole Genome Science Foundation Incorporated. Please don't forget to participate in the survey. Thank you to our panelists. Dr. Stephanie Myers, co-founder and national co-chair of Black Women for Positive Change Incorporated. Thank you, Dr. Myers, for your participation. And now, Dr. Georgia Dunstan, president, CEO, founder of the Whole Genome Science Foundation Incorporated, Howard University Professor Emerita, founding and former director of the National Human Genome Center for Howard University's College of Medicine. Next, Dr. Barbara Reynolds, ordained minister, chaplain for the Black Women for Positive Change Incorporated, civil rights activist, journalist, and author. Dr. Pranessa Seal, founder and CEO, Balm and in Gilead Incorporated, and home of the Healthy Church's 2020 National Conference. Dr. Orisa De Awadola, root psychologist, author, lecturer, researcher, and founder for the Institute of African-Centered Thought. We'd like to say thank you to all of the entrants and semi-finalists from the Harmony Jam, as well as today's winners, Deanna Duncan, Maxwell May, and Ijoma Okire. Thanks to the sponsors for the event. Black Women for Positive Change. The Whole Genome Science Foundation. And our community partners, DCTV and Feelings on Fire Productions. I'm Dr. Sheree Ward, have a blessed, Safe and great afternoon. Good day.